Welcome to the Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bowen. Melanie Astles is an extraordinary aerobatics pilot, and if you haven't heard about her, where have you been? She was the first woman to enter the Red Bull Air Races back in the day, and the first to win one at Indianapolis in 2017. This past month, she's been in Las Vegas competing for Team GB in the World Advanced Aerobatics Championships, where she placed fifth. Now, on her way home, she popped into the Pima Air and Space Museum, for whom she is an ambassador, and the team there, who also very kindly sponsor this podcast, put her in front of a laptop and told her to speak to Matt. So, <laughs> what you're about to listen to now is our chats last week, which was really great fun because it's an opportunity to ask an incredibly talented aerobatics pilot, how the heck do they make those aircraft defy the laws of physics? But as always with this pod, we got to find out where someone's passion for aviation came from. And that's where we'll start by asking Mel, where did it all begin for her? How does a girl from rugby end up with a fabulous French accent, but flying with the GB aerobatics team. How does how does that all happen? Because that's quite a tale, isn't it? Yeah, my life tends to be quite um, atypical in the way I do things. And uh, so basically I was born in rugby and I came to France when I was three years old. So uh, I was brought up in France uh, during uh, well, 20, uh, 37 years <laughs> until now. <laughs> And now I'm growing up a bit, so I'm, uh, I'm speaking English also, and I'm going to England from time to time. And uh, yeah, I used to be flying in the French team, and uh, the way of, uh, of doing things in the French team was not the best for me, for my performance and to be the best. So the British team welcomed me um, to fly for them, and uh, well, because actually I have a British passport also, so it's not normal. And uh, really happy doing it. And in the championship that I did in Vegas in last week. Actually, I was the only one in the team, but hopefully next year there will be a bigger team that will rejoin. And my aim was also to get these guys coming and back to the sport and rejoining because, yeah, we want to have more people involved in it. 100%. Yeah. So how did, how did you get into flying? Was it a passion from a young age or was it something that hit a little bit later? Flying has always been a, a passion. When I was uh, six years old, I went to an air show. Uh, I saw, well, I was sat in the Harrier and I, and I had a revelation. I said, uh, this is what I want to do. I have another story. It's the, the movie, The Never Ending Story, where you get uh, this little boy who goes uh, on his dragon all over the world. And I was thinking, well, one, one day I'd like my dragon and I'd like to have this freedom. And uh, yeah, it's just, I don't know, the pictures of uh, the guy flying in the mountains and seeing the landscape, the mountains, the sea, the blue sky. And I was thinking, I want to do that. I love that movie. I have very good memories of that movie. Mm. Yeah. So how did you sort of channel that passion? What, 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 was, what was your first flight? Did everything sort of come together quite well? Or was it a sort of longer process that you had to sort of fight a little bit harder to, to, to make sure you became a professional pilot? So first of all, I started flying. My first flight was when I was 21 years old. And uh, I could have started earlier, but of course, uh, life has uh, decided that flying was not for me because it was too expensive. And uh, as I wanted to be in the military, uh, it was still, there weren't many models, feminine models who fly. So uh, yeah, I kind of uh, went off on the road when I was 18 and quit school. And I started working in gas station for several years. And then one day I thought, well, um, it's uh, snowing today, so let's go and figure out how to fly. No. <laughs> and uh, I arrived in uh, Lyon, in the uh, air club in Lyon. Everything was closed, except one door. And this is often uh, in life uh, when just the one person is there at a good moment and a good time. And I met this guy who's called Jack, who's a uh, real passionate, and he basically spent the afternoon with me. And uh, the day after I was flying, and uh, I was really worried about it because uh, when you have a dream so deep in your heart and you think it's the only thing in your life, and I was scared of not liking it, in fact, because uh, I imagined so many great things and I was scared of being scared. I was scared of not liking it. So I did this first flight and then uh, it was too late. I couldn't come back and I just loved it. And I could have cried of happiness so, so much I loved it. So 
yeah, that's how I started. So I'm 21 years old. Most of us love flying, going up and passing around in the sky. And whereas I never got my license, I, I did fly around a bit in friends' airplanes. It's a bit of a jump to go from flying around quite nicely in airplanes to flinging the airplane around the sky in a way that, to be fair, will spill your drink. So what, what was that sort of progression into aerobatics for you? Because that, that must have been... That must have been quite a fun journey to, to start out on. Yeah. So first of all, I've always liked uh, speed, adrenaline, fast bike, fast cars, uh, or everything that goes fast and that's kind of dangerous, I liked. So of course, flying I liked. And if you mix it with my uh, adrenaline rush need, it fits really well with aerobatics. And uh, I also like uh, competing. I like uh, becoming a better version of myself. So... Uh, competition came quickly uh, in my life and uh, yeah it's kind of a, I didn't manage to become a fighter pilot so flying aerobatics uh, is a way of doing it without being involved in the war so it's quite cool and uh, the maneuverability of the aircraft is is really amazing so yeah the first time I flew aerobatics I was just uh, I was just addict immediately because it's it's one of those things that <laughs> It seems to be very much on the edge of everything going horribly, horribly wrong. And I guess that's what the excitement is for both things. Because we, we all know that, you know, airplanes fly by magic. But when you are doing the aerobatics that you do, how do you manage to, to the outsider, bend the laws of physics the way, the way you do? How, 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 do, how is just the easiest question there? Because it's incredible when you get to see it. We're going to talk about the, the air races and things in a minute, but when you get into the the proper aerobatics style aircraft, what sort of mindset do you need as a pilot so that you can, you can do those quite extraordinary things? Well, I would say, first of all, you don't start aerobatics by flying uh, plus nine, minus nine Gs and flying a plane that does one and a half roll in, a, in less than a second. So you start like somebody who would be... You're, 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 spoil, you're spoiling the illusion now. Man. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm always um, very uh, <laughs> close to the ground when I explain that. It's just to say that somebody who's running a... I mean, somebody who's running a marathon, for example, he's not just entered there and ran his marathon. So it's a bit the same. It's like you start by running a bit, then a bit more, then a bit more. So you start on a two-seater aircraft with an instructor. You just do a loop. You just do a... I'm ahead, you do very basic figures, which are not basic when you start because it's already a lot. It's just not normal to have a plane flying upside down for anybody on earth. So you need to get used to that. And then you need to be sick a bit and get through this moment where you're not feeling very good when you get out of the plane. All these people are talking to you and uh, they're asking you questions and you just want to go and lie down and sleep. So you need to go through all these difficult, painful steps. Like for any sport where you do the training for running, you get really tired and you're really exhausted, you can't speak. And step by step, you go up, you go up, and it's like everything in life when you reach a very high uh, target. It's all by going every time one little step, one little step, one little mm -hmm. step, and then you reach this big picture. So, yeah, I would say it's just a matter of uh, experience and a lot of years of, uh, of doing these small steps, sometimes falling back and going back up higher. So, uh, yeah, it's just... It's, it's, you need a lot of motivation, a lot of uh, work, and uh, you need also, uh, of course, uh, to have finances to put some fuel in the aircraft to train. But I've never been really rich in the training and having the money to train, so I used to always work a lot on my brain simulator. So you can actually do a lot of, a lot of things with your brain and, and train a lot. I, I remember chatting to Kim Campbell, the, the A-10 pilot, who talked a lot about the chair flying. And I guess that's that same sort of thing is the visualization process of working through all the possibilities so that you can then do it when you actually get hands-on. So is it that same sort of process where you're yeah. just doing the entire routine in your head and then making executing it when you get in the aircraft? Yeah, yeah, definitely. When uh, So I'm just back from the World Championships and uh, I really nailed the program where... What I do is I kind of calculate everything on the ground because we don't train before. And you can actually figure out uh, without going in exaggerated details because then you get too many information. But you can actually calculate things. And uh, I think this is one of my strengths also. I sometimes maybe not appear like someone like that, but I'm really calculating things and trying to figure out where I'm going to put this figure. When, I, when I'm flying a figure, I'm thinking three or four figures after. So I'm always trying to make it work this way. 
So yeah, it's uh, training in the plane is important, and uh, training it with a coach is important. And uh, when you reach the highest level, then it's more difficult because it's you need to find people above your level. So you need to become your own coach, and it's like a professor. You're researching things and you're trying to find new things that people don't know and that you figured out on your own. So yeah, it's really never ends. So what is it the aircraft that you you perform in at the moment? So at the moment I'm flying in a, it's a German aircraft. It's a, the brand is Nextra. It's a 330 SC. So it's a 315 horsepower Lycoming uh, engine with a free blade pr- propeller. And it's, uh, yeah, it's quite, uh, quite fun. It does uh, like a 420 degrees roll per second, which is same, more than a roll in a second. So uh, yeah, you need to be awake when you fly and focused. <laughs> It's, uh, so if, if I'm not awake, it's stronger than me, the plane. And uh, yeah, it's a beautiful aircraft. It's mainly, I would say, uh, 80% of the competition, uh, high-level competition is extra. Mm. We have a few other aircrafts, but it's the main uh, main competitor mm. as an aircraft, is the extra. So I guess it's high torque, but low weight aircraft. So you're, you're using... You're using that to help with those with those maneuvers as well. So it's it, it's almost going back to say early First World War aircraft that used high high powered engines, lightweight, to do some really <laughs> phenomenal <laughs> phenomenal things. Yeah. How 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 do you get used to balancing those things out and knowing um, yeah knowing which way things go so that you can get out, especially when you're thinking two or three moves ahead. Well, there's a lot of things to consider when you're flying because uh, every detail counts. Uh, you can have also a lot of gyros- gyroscopic forces that are gonna you're gonna encounter. You're gonna have all the yeah the the prop effects when you put full power. The, the aircraft is gonna go to the left completely. So you always need to kind of play with all of these elements. This is really the end level when you can actually put everything in t- into one piece and make a flight. And because uh, when you fly a, a sequence in aerobatics, you have the technical pl- part that is flying the figures. And then you have uh, the, the presentation, which is uh, putting the figures in, uh, in a good place. And then you have really the, um, well, making the good figures at the good moment. It's You can make a perfect figure, but if it's in the wrong direction, you don't get scored. So there's all of this. It's a mix of a mental game, physical game, and a technical game. And uh, once you put all of this into place, then you can make a very nice flight and have a good mark. So I suppose it's making sure you're keeping the energy up on the aircraft so they can continue to do what it's needing to do. Because I I guess that's a fine balance as well, because you could probably pull something off that's incredible, but that leaves you with not enough energy to pull off the next move. Is that that the thinking? Yeah, Yeah, you need to manage your energy during the flight. Uh, When we were flying in Vegas, it's an airport that's uh, 2,800 feet on the ground. It was quite hot. So when we're flying, it's uh, between 1,000 feet from the ground to 3,000 feet. And the density altitude, which is the altitude the real what the plane is living in, uh, it's the air he's living in, was like six to eight thousand five hundred feet. So it's really high. It's like a mountain flying. So mm-hmm. the aircraft doesn't have three hundred and fifteen horsepower. It actually has two fifty, two forty. So I was lucky to have a one with a powerful engine. But some guys had a two hundred horsepower engine. That was really tough for them because uh, well, it was high. So it's it's sort of reining, reining back what you can do a little bit so that you're able able to keep doing that. Now, the I think the majority of people would probably remember you from the Red Bull Air Race days. How does that differ from an aerobatics competition? Granted, it's an air race and we you know, watched on telly and things. But how do you approach an air race as opposed to an aerobatics competition? What's, what's the difference is there? Because I suppose these days... The thing that has stuck in everyone's head were those those fantastic erasers from from the like, the pre COVID days, those halcyon days before we all got locked away. What, what's what's the process like for an air race as opposed to an aerobatics competition? I would compare an air race to a, a ski slalom. Uh, like it's a, it's a very short run. You have to be very precise. You have to be very fluid in your flying, and you have to uh, waste the less energy possible. So it's. Uh, really a matter of uh, fluidity and uh, the winner is the fastest so it's uh, we go one by one there's a time and the fastest wins so this is very evident to understand it's uh, kind of simple for the spectators and uh, the aerobatics is a judging sport so you have uh, between six and ten judges on the ground it's like ice skating you fly figures uh, in front of the judges and they score you and in the end the pilot with the best score wins the, the competition. 
So mm -hmm. it's the same aircraft, I would say, flying. There's little differences, but it's not really big. And the but in the end, one is a dredging sport, one is a speed sport and a racing, and but it's the same aircrafts. And I guess just from my layman sitting on the ground having a beer and watching all all of you guys do fantastic things. The verticality as well is quite different, isn't it? Because in the air race, you're staying quite low to the ground. How is that affecting the, the movement of the aircraft, especially with, I guess, turbulence from being that close, as opposed to being more more high, having greater altitude in an, in an aerobatic competition? What what are the things that you have to compensate for? Yeah, that's a good question. Actually, the, the main difference between both is uh, in the air race, it's a re the requirement in focus is huge because uh, you're flying uh, 10 meters above the ground, you're flying about 100 meters per second, so we know about what's the time between uh, the ground and you. So you just can't, a mistake, a mistake and you, you won't make it, so you, you touch the ground, you just need to focus much more because you can't afford a mistake. The aerobatics flying in the air race is very simple, it's, uh, it's not, there's, it's like sportsman level because you, you do half Cubans and you do like chicanes. But the mm -hmm. fact that you're flying really close to the ground is, uh, and you're flying, actually, you're flying through obstacles also, so sometimes you hit them, and it's, uh, it's something that requires a really high level of skill, but also a high level of focus. Uh, when you're flying in the air race, you need to be focused. In aerobatics, uh, you need, of course, a lot of focus, but it's not as dangerous if you don't focus, let's say. On the same time, you need much more physical engagement when you're flying aerobatics, because it's, uh, you're going to fly... Uh, yeah, between plus nine and minus nine Gs. Well, for some people, minus nine. And uh, it's going to be like 15 figures, and it's going to last like six, seven minutes. A, a run in an air race is one minute. So on the physical side, it's much more demanding to fly uh, aerobatics. That must mean your physical training is intense to be able to cope with that, because having watched your YouTube videos as well. You do pull some interesting faces when the camera's on you as well. And that's, <laughs> I guess, just keeping everything together so that you don't do it. What training do you do to ensure that you can cope with that level of G-force when you get into the aircraft? So the, the training about uh, being fit in the aircraft is a long-term thing. I've been searching a lot about it and trying different things. And uh, yeah, the, basically the, the main thing you want when you're flying is uh, not getting out of breath because if you get out of breath, then you, you're mind is not going to work as well and you're not going to be focused as if you were really fit. And also there's another thing, in my case, uh, I have a very uh, dynamic and uh, aggressive style when I fly and I mix it with very smooth moments so I kind of make this style but I need to really have a big uh, uh, speed when I do the figures. So when I roll, I roll very fast but I stop very fast. So for that it's like explosivity, you have to train a lot with elastics and uh, just uh, with bands and uh, you you work your force. I've learned also with time that being strong in your legs makes you strong in your arms and uh, all these kind of things where you try and figure out the best way. But mainly, yeah, it's having a good uh, cardiovascular and having a low cardio and be able, don't be out of breath when you fly and having a good core where you can resist because then there's the G, you need to be able to counteract the Gs and this is a lot... Uh, the core training that does that. As someone who's very little core, <laughs> it just it sounds like a lot of hard work. But I guess I guess it pays off in in those in those sort of eight minutes when you are. Mm, it's a big difference. Course. We're going to take a quick break so that we can get the latest from the Pima Air and Space Museum with Head of Collections Andrew Bowley. Here we are at the Pima Air and Space Museum with our Lucian IL-2 Sturmabek. Um, the Sturmerbeck was the most produced military aircraft in history with 36,000 built. Um, third most produced aircraft ever um, behind the Cessna 172 and the Boeing 737. It's an interesting aircraft that it's made out of multiple different materials. The cockpit and the engine is all kind of behind armored steel. The inner wing is kind of aluminum like you'd expect. And then the outer wing is all made out of wood with metal struts and obviously metal fixtures and stuff. And the rear fuselage is also made out of wood with the horizontal being made out of metal and the vertical being uh, wood and metal and fabric. These aircraft could take up quite a bit of punishment. You know, they were designed to just kind of get in there and be protect, protect their air crew from ground attack fire, um, whether it was, you know, 
you know, 20 millimeter cannons or machine guns or light weaponry. Um, they had bomb bays underneath the wings um, where the weapons, uh, where the bomb bays were, they had rocket um, slots out on the wings for rails for rockets. Um, they had cannons in the wings and also machine guns. The cockpit is, if you notice, the front windshield is made out of laminated armored glass, and the thing is ridiculously thick. Um, this aircraft itself was uh, restored from a wreck um, from a lake in Russia near Leningrad. This aircraft was shot down on, well, I was going to say on its last mission, it was obviously its last <laughs> mission, but it was shot down near the end of the siege of Leningrad. It was during winter. Looking at the recovered wreck, um, it looks like it took some fire in the um, radiator cooler vent there on the bottom, which probably caused the engine to overheat. So they made an emergency landing on a frozen lake. The crew got out. It ended up sinking in the lake after the ice melted. And then back in the um, 88 or 89, the Russian Navy recovered this aircraft because this actually did fly with the Russian Navy, not the Russian Air Force, but they were all doing the same thing around Leningrad. It's not like this thing was you know, slinging torpedoes around. Um, but it got recovered, all the metal bits, um, the original tires were still on the aircraft with air in the inner tubes, um, which those we have taken off of the tires and put them away to put on display eventually um, when we do a more thorough display about the Sturmovec and the Eastern Front and this aircraft in particular. But it was an interesting story long before I started working here at the museum. I think sometime in the late 90s or so, or early 2000s, the museum was called up. This woman, her husband had passed away. I think he lived out in California, if I recall correctly. It was like, we have an airplane in our hangar. Do you want it? And we're like, well, what type of aircraft is it? Well, the last thing anyone expected was that this guy had a Sturmovec sitting in his garage. So as I said, it was all the metal bits. The landing gear was still retracted in there. There was air in the tires. Um, a few years ago, we started going in the restoration. We hired a gentleman in Germany who had plans. He built the wooden wood parts. He built the wooden fuselage where Fusage shifted out and he, his uh, woodworker came out here and built up the two wings and then we kind of cleaned it up as best as you know we could and used all the original parts and made it the, uh, well actually at this point, the only Sturmovec on public display here in the United States. Um, there's one in private hands and the Smithsonian is apparently working on theirs as well, probably because you know, since we got ours done they wanted to get theirs done. To learn more about what is on display and what events are coming up at the Pima Air and Space Museum in Tucson, Arizona, please do check out their website at www.pimaair.org. And now, back to the show. Now, you've just been in Vegas for the World Championships. Is it the World Championships? I, what what's, what that? happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Oh no, yeah, sorry, it's not, this, it's, it's not this moment I should not say. Not the same yeah. thing, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> to, be, to be fair, as, yeah. as a lapsed Formula One fan, I'm kind of ignoring yeah. what's happening in Vegas yeah. at all at the moment. Yeah. 12,000 pounds a ticket, that's just... Oh, really? 12,000? Oh, that, that, no, it's... Yeah. Oh, $12,000 yeah. for some of the, the seats, yeah. Oh, it's, really? It's mad. Yeah. Because there aren't many seats, it's is bad. that it? I just think that whatever seats they have, they're just charging yeah. an absolute fortune for Yeah, they're going mad on it. Pay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they'll pay, yeah. Yeah. So it was Vegas. Oh, yeah. Sorry, so I you, messed up your question. No, 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 no. That, that, that's as yeah. this. The, trust me, this show has yeah. many digressions. You should yeah. hear the one that Scott yeah, and I did. Okay. It was mostly us drinking. Well, with Scott, I can understand. There's a lot of digr digression. Oh yeah, yeah. hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, I can, I can hear he's him. Not, he's not hear here him next to me listening at all. No? It's, uh, definitely not. I can hear him yeah. scowling yeah. over the internet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's pretending he's on his phone doing something, but he's checking what I'm saying, like. Uh, He's probably sending an email cancelling yeah. the sponsorship, well, we sent, but that's a different... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm not saying what he's doing. No, oh, great. Um, yeah, so anyways, Vegas, the things yeah. that we can talk about that happened in Vegas. Yeah. Um, how you, You've been out in the States now for... Oh, it's been about a month now since you, you arrived yeah. to start the training and things. How, how has that all gone? Because it, it, it's been a successful few weeks, hasn't it? So yeah. what's, the, what's the US trip look like for you and Team GB? So basically, the, the trip started uh, exactly four weeks ago, and the aim was to arrive here, get rid of the jet lag for a few days, then uh, take possession of the aircraft, because I wasn't flying uh, 
my aircraft for the championship uh, because of course as we know shipping an aircraft is a lot of uh, mm. problems so um actually i i uh, lent, i rented an aircraft that was based in phoenix so the aim was to fly this aircraft get get comfortable with it and uh, we had a little few issues to fix uh, on the aircraft so actually we've done a lot of uh, uh, mechanics and things like that and like two days before it was fixed and i managed to train so we did mm -hmm. the training uh, in the phoenix box it was really interesting because uh, it's on a very busy airport deer valley airport and it's like there's all the training school for the chinese and it's that so it just took me like 15 minutes to taxi to the holding point it took me another 15 minutes to wait at the holding point there were 15 minutes to fly to the box and then I was flying aerobatics. So yeah, I was really, never done that in my life, but, and it was 40 degrees, so very hot. And so yeah, I trained like this. And then I went to Vegas uh, uh, the week uh, before the championship, had a few flights over there in the, in the aerobatic box of competition, mm -hmm. which was uh, really interesting because it's in the middle of the mountains and flying aerobatics in the mountains is not easy because you don't know where your horizon is. We have like a triangle on the wing that helps us to visualize where we are in the sky. And you put this triangle on your wing, you look at it when you're going up vertical, and you put it on the mountain so it, it's vertical. But the thing is, if it's in the mountain, it's hard to know if it's really vertical completely. And uh, so that was a bit, honestly, for me, it was very challenging. I was not comfortable with that. And even at the championship, it was uh, the first flight, and I, I was a bit lost with this... Uh, this loss of horizon problem, but yeah, it's uh, it was the same for everybody at the same time. So. And and I guess that's when, if you're not perfectly vertical, that's when judges start taking points away from you. Yeah, they remove points when you're not vertical, and then when you go up and you're not vertical, when you go down, you're not vertical also. So you lose another two points up, then two points down. So it's uh, it's very important to be vertical. So what I did uh, in the, the works we did on the aircraft. We installed a second uh, sighting device, which is the, the like a triangle we have on the wing, and we installed one on the right side, which I never really used. But there, I understood that sometimes when there was a mountain on the left, I could look on the right and find like a horizon on my right. So it was, it was just making sure you had that extra check. So even though that's just a half second glance, you just yeah. knew that you were you had a little bit more. To we do had a, a we had a figure which we call a tail slide. So you go up. Everybody was <laughs> dreading that, and so. British pilot probably put it well. And, and it's like you go up like that and uh, you go backwards and you have to decide if you go canopy up or canopy down. So basically mm -hmm. you have to go slide down this way or slide down this way, but it has to go backwards. So if you're not completely straight, it could actually go in the wrong direction. So it's like a bit of a, a, bit of a bet. But I was thinking because we're in Vegas, maybe it's good to play the championship on a bet like a uh, but I think the people didn't do so bad on it. Uh, normally, it was quite okay. Mine was nice. I liked it. Well, you did, mm. you did very well. Mm. How is the, the result going? Because you were fifth? Overall? Yeah, I finished fifth overall yes. out of 58 competitors, which uh, is... Uh, well, uh, if I could have bought this result, I would have bought it at the beginning. It was... Uh, <laughs> I don't know what I was really expecting. And uh, I was, yeah, really happy about it. And uh, it's given me motivation for the next years. It's given a lot of uh, move in the, the British team. I think we'll have a big team next year. And uh, I'm really happy to be able to motivate the people from the Great Britain team to come back to aerobatics and make the Great Britain team the best in the world. That's really exciting. So it's... How how does next year look for the team at the moment? What, what has there has there been met much lined up for it already, or is that what happens when you get back? That planning starts ready for the new season. So basically, there's a uh, different steps. I mean, British Aerobatics is being uh, restructured completely now. The management is being restructured in next month, and uh, mm -hmm. so there's going to be new things arriving, a new management team, and uh, there's a lot of um, of uh, motivation to make the sport more media friendly. Uh, we're doing an open in July from the 10th to the 14th of July where there will be the nationals plus all the countries can come and are welcome to come and compete also and uh, mm -hmm. so this is going to really um, motivate people to come and fly and then we're thinking about uh, having a team in advance and be able to first win in advance before going to unlimited because 
there's a big, big step between both. You need to train a lot. And even if you train a lot like crazy, you fight, you're flying with military pilots who are overtrained and who have sometimes a bit of bias effect on the judging and stuff. So I think the good thing would be to build a good advanced team uh, to get some good results, to get some sponsorships out of that, and then to kind of create a system a bit like what they do in France is good. It's like uh, they have a system where then you can go up, but for that, you need people at the upper level. And yeah. for example, alone, I can't win an unlimited because it's a team job. And uh, they had a really good pilot, Gerald Cooper, who uh, never won because he was talented, but he doesn't have a team. And I realized that in this championship that I was alone and I had to do all the job. And also I have no tips of anybody. And uh, it's, uh, it's, you, there's some things you can't do. For example, when there's the unknown programs, we can uh, draw figures. But as I was on your country with one person, I was not allowed to play the game and, and just propose my figures, which could actually maybe make it more difficult for the others. Uh, the only figure I did was this tail slide, but I had to give it to somebody else who did it for me. But I think it's, uh, it's important to have a bigger team to get... Well, if I wanted to win, for example, I need a bigger team. It's difficult alone. Yeah, I can imagine, because I guess it's, as well, you're getting excellent amount of feedback from fellow pilots as well. So mm. you're not, you're being able to point things out that other teams may be noticing, but you're not getting that feedback because, of course, competition. Exactly. So and there's a team to... championship also. So uh, there's a game to play in a, in a team championship. So I think if... The two or three pilots I'm thinking about, uh, Command Fly, we could actually go on a podium on a, on a team cha championship. And uh, next nice. year, Fly, we have a Europeans, which will kind of get the judges to know us and then score well at the World Championships. How many events are there in the champion? Is it just like one big thing or is it like a, a, a series that builds up to a, a final score? Uh, it's, uh, are, so are in a competition in aerobatics, in a worldwide competition, you get four flights. And uh, you don't always get to fly them if the weather's bad. We did get to fly them in Vegas, and the fourth flight is the most difficult one and the one where everybody's tired and makes mistakes. So it's always good to go to, to do all of them. So this competition was kind of success in this, in this sense that we did all of the programs. And uh, so the first program, we call it the known program. Basically, it's everybody works on it all year round and can present it on the competition. And then you, in the past, you used to have a free program, which was another one you draw yourself. They've removed that. And now it's three unknown, unknown programs, which are drawn by the pilots. And um, everybody flies the same, but you can, there's the, the same ingredients, mm. but the, the, you can do your own recipe your own with flourish. it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So there's a bit yeah. of a, it's a bit of a drawing competition and administration competition, which is where I'm not as good. So I had to do my own drawings and stuff and, they were not very happy because uh, something was a bit messy on my sheet. So it's this is where when you have a, somebody who can do it for you, and it's a lot of work to create a program because it's like a musician. To play music is not the same as to create the music. So mm. there I was requested to play the music, to create it, and uh, to actually choose which was the best uh, music part because I could actually pick the music from another country. And I always find it better when everybody flies the same thing exactly. But this is how it is. Next year will be better. We'll improve it. We, we're there to improve the things in the sport. Super. So whereabouts in the UK is the team going to be based? Or is that still to be decided? Yeah, there's no, I mean, there's no real base. I think uh, then it's often, things happen often in Cywell. The, the, mm -hmm. the Open will be in yep. Cywell. It's an airport I like a lot, uh, Cywell. And, uh, mm -hmm. But there's not a real base because it's a lot of individuals flying and they kind of rejoin in, uh, in training camps. But for the moment, I don't have the information for next year and what's happening. It was just really a comeback for me, and uh, and now they're really, really happy about it. And I think they've adopted me completely now. Of course. <laughs> You're a full-blown English woman now. Or yeah, British, exactly. Britain. Yeah. There yeah. we go. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think we need to, we need to talk, because you are out in the sunny, lovely Tucson, Arizona, and the Pima Air and Space Museum kindly sponsor both of us. What is what is that brought to you as as a pilot with sponsorship? Because this is not a cheap thing to do, is it? So it is is having the support of yeah we laugh we can laugh about him a bit more. Scott there chatting on. Yeah, he can't hear what. And, and, yeah, and, hear what and the team. yeah, we can say what we want about yeah. him. He'll, he'll fight. <laughs> well, he'll he can hear what I'm saying. That's the problem. You're not in trouble. But I'm in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> he'll, I'll be in trouble yeah. when he hears yeah, yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, when he hears it after. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I suppose it's. 
that having that backing from lots of different places as well must be really rewarding for you as well, seeing that you're being noticed far and wide. Because I suppose it, it's, is it normal for, say, a museum on the other side of the world to sponsor a pilot in Europe? What's really interesting, interesting is that I'm worldwide. It's like, I don't feel like I'm French, I'm British. It's like, mm. for me, the world is one and uh, I'm really happy to promote uh, the passion for aviation wherever I am. And I think that's where my link is there also with the museum because uh, it's not there's no borders in uh, in passion in history of aviation and and it's really nice to be able to have a sponsor that shares the same vision as me in passion and uh, it's not just about uh, me being uh, selling a product or whatever it's me selling passion for aviation and I find it very uh, well first I find I'm really really grateful for that and uh, I'd like to thank them a lot because. Uh, I would have not be able to continue what I'm doing and I wouldn't be fifth at the World Championship. Uh, I mean, when I was a little girl, if I'd have imagined, and this is what relaxed me really at the World Championship, I was a bit stressed at the beginning and then I thought, the little girl in me, if ever she'd have imagined being at the World Championship in Las Vegas, what would she have thought? She would have been amazed and like she'd have been wow. So I just kept that in my brain and I was like, how lucky I am to be there and uh, of course, all of this needs finance, and thanks to the Pima and Space Museum, I can put some fuel in the aircraft, I can fly the aircraft, and I can be good and performant, and also I can do a lot of uh, promotion of aviation, and we have had so many following on this championship. We're going to find the numbers soon, but it's, it's huge, it's huge. And so we're really happy to have this role in the world of aviation, but not just aviation, because there are people following us who are not pilots, but they are in a bad moment and they feel like, yeah, I can actually live my dream because Mel is not that complicated to reach and she's simple and she's close to us. And maybe if I have this dream of doing this job, maybe I can actually start my way towards it. Fantastic. And that, that, that was going to be sort of my, my wrap up question is sort of yeah. the, the, the roles you do as an ambassador for aviation and, and things. How does that help you in, in, in that bringing more people into this this wonderful, very strange world that we that we inhabit. I, I, I suppose what what does what does that bring for you as well? Seeing seeing the individuals that you're able to to bring to flight. Well, I think it brings that, as you you, you know my background. I, I was discouraged to to do this and to live my dreams of flying, and I have kind of a, if if I can help anybody not not losing so much time and actually not giving up. Uh, it's a victory for me and it's uh, all about uh, yeah, making this world a bit better on my side by getting people doing great stuff because the more positive energy is on the planet, the more it vibrates well. So it's just, uh, yeah, just a little bit, bit of me who's doing that. And this is where with the museum, the Pima and Space Museum, we are aligned because I think they have the same, uh, same objective because uh, as we know, it's, uh, it's not something where we gain money it's something where we we share and inspire and it's like uh, it costs money but it's something that we are sharing the same mission and uh, and i'm really proud to be carrying their colors fantastic so next year is a big year um i guess i'm, I'm actually just going to come out and say this when you guys start getting training can i come and visit and we can <laughs> We can, we can, we can, Absolutely. we can meet probably, and I can yeah. see you do your thing. Yeah, well, maybe we could. Yeah. Uh, we're going to organize some training camps with the British team. Uh, I mean, I, I'm based in France, and in the winter I go to Spain. Mm -hmm. But we're going to figure out something. Actually, they're coming in south of France in April. So if you want to travel to south of France, uh, you could come and do. Uh, I'm, I'm always, ha yeah. always happy. <laughs> you to can come, come and do uh, <laughs> an interview of the whole British team uh, in south of France if you want. <laughs> If if I say to my wife that do you fancy popping to the, the south of France, yeah. she'll she'll immediately have a list of vineyards that we need yeah. to visit as well. So uh, I'm yeah. sure we can yeah. make it work. I can help you about the vineyards. I know a few uh, a few friends who have nice ones around. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. It's mm. even it's even better. It's yeah. a deal. We should we should do that. We actually, no wine is getting better and better in England apparently. So we see this yeah. is it. I am in Sussex and mm. we have fabulous fabulous grapes because it's the same chalk seam that comes mm -hmm. up from champagne so the, okay. the terroir is mm -hmm. very similar so mm -hmm. when you're here i can show you around some fabulous vineyards for some english sparkling mm, cool. white which is which is very nice which is again a completely different podcast which i'm yeah. sure needs to be made this about, is for the new podcast about, wine and flying uh, no. <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm not sure i'm not sure scott will sponsor that yeah. one but. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we are one year of flying <laughs> <laughs> 
Melody, thank you so much for being dragged in front of a microphone by Scott. And, yeah, uh, I wasn't expecting that, but I'm, I'm good at improvising. So yeah, why not? How can people find you online? Where is the best place to, to follow you? So the best place to follow to follow me is on uh, Instagram, uh, Melania Stalls, Facebook the same, Melania Stalls, A-S-T-L-E-S. -S. I'm also on uh, LinkedIn and uh, you have my website, www.melaniastalls.com. Super. I'll put all of those links into the description for the pod as well, so everybody can, okay. can follow you there. Cool. Melanie, thank, thank you very much. so much. Well, thank you, and uh, see you soon in South of France then. Oh, 100%. That, yeah. that, that's a deal. We're yeah. on. Cool. <laughs> and well done for everything that you do. It's, it's amazing. I like it. Yeah. Oh, mm. thank you. Yeah. I'm, I'm going I'm mm. to leave, leave that into the pod yeah. as well, just to, to make it mm. feel better. I cannot thank Melanie Assels enough for joining us here on the Damcasters. And I cannot thank Scott Marchand and the team at the Pima Air and Space Museum enough for sponsoring this pod and for putting Mel in front of a laptop and telling her to speak to me for a little while because it was really, really cool. And I hope you enjoyed what you heard. Now, Mel's Instagram feed is just a treasure trove of, of some of the incredible things she does in her aircraft. So please give that a follow. Check out all the other links to her in the description below. And of course, do check out Pima Air and Space as well, because they have just broken ground on the new military vehicle museum, which is going to be fantastic for those of you who like your vehicles slightly more terrestrial than our aviation sort of things. As always, I have to thank everybody for your support of the pod. It has been incredible. Like and subscribe, pop some stars into your podcast app of choice. The algorithms live on these things. So whatever you can do, that would be fantastic. If you fancy joining us on Patreon, you can become a damn castier for just three pounds a month, plus a bit of that. You get a welcome card from me, some bookmarks, some stickers, all that fun stuff. Why not join us? You get these episodes early, different intro, outro, no ads throughout, which is always a bonus. Do check that out. Links in the description below. And really, I just want to say once again, thank you all for the support of the pod. It means the world to me that people are enjoying me chatting with some fantastic people. And we've got some really fun stuff coming up. Next few episodes are going to be all about speed. We're talking SR-71, A-12, YF-12, B-58. In other words, we're going Blackbird and Hustler, people. Stay tuned. Until then, do take care of yourselves and thank you ever so much for listening. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bow and is a Bony Abroad podcast production. To learn more about our podcast and check out our previous episodes, head to www.thedamcasterspod.com.